So thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Rob Pace. I'm the CEO and founder of 100X. And I get to partner with the amazing Mickey Kidder from Notre Dame. Mickey is the senior executive there, but has a number of responsibilities, but one of which is in donor relations, but also university relations, et cetera. And uh, I'm gonna try to be very quick because Mickey is just extraordinary and I'm excited for her to tell you about what we're doing together at Notre Dame. So our talk is about listening at scale. And so what I'm gonna do is, is kind of give you the theory. And, and at 100X, we work across all industries. So what I'm gonna to try to do is give you a flavor for what we're seeing everywhere. And then Mickey's gonna talk about specifically in the donor, in the donor field as well. So as, as I think about uh, listening, the first thing we think about is outcomes. And so probably the biggest change in my business career is happening right now, which is this migration from companies being organi organized around products, programs, services, to outcomes. And this has profound impl implications for how organizations are gonna be organized, et cetera. And our belief is outcomes are personal and you cannot succeed in an outcomes-driven world if you can't listen at scale. So that's really the argument that we're gonna try to, to share to you, or at least the thinking about it. So just outcomes, and I think most people are familiar with it, but, but let me just try to make that a little more tangible. So for, for four years, I was the national chairman of the Salvation Army, which is the second largest charity. A decade ago, donors would, 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 the conversation would be, you know, how many meals we serve, how many countries we're in. Now the question is, how many lives did you change? That's the migration from programs to outcomes. Some of you deal in the healthcare world, and literally reimbursement right now, if you go in for a knee or hip replacement, and you get readmitted within 60 days, basically the service providers have to do it for free. So they've suddenly moved to the outcomes business as opposed to the provision of services business. And we're seeing that in every industry everywhere. And it's a profound shift. Organizations, the organizing principle of most businesses is around outcomes, uh, is, is currently around products or, or programs. We think that the, the, the migration is gonna to move towards everything being around outcomes. So in that world, we think it makes sense that being able to listen at scale will define best in class companies. Right now, as Mickey will describe, we see it as a huge differentiating opportunity, but I think a decade from now, it'll be a major competitive disadvantage if you can't listen at scale. So what do we mean by listening? I'm gonna spend a few minutes just on a few examples outside of education to give you a, a sense. But I'd say the first thing is thinking about technology a little bit differently. So uh, once upon a, a time, I was a, a partner at Goldman Sachs, and I ran the West Coast operation, so half of our clients were technology companies and half, half weren't. And originally, in 1986, I joined the Microsoft team the, the year we, we took it public, and that was about driving efficiency, right? Think, think about Word and operating systems and Excel. More recently, technology has really driven distribution. Amazon, Google Ads, et cetera. What we're excited about is, a, is rethinking technology to how can we get it to replicate and enable the best of human behavior. So we call that empathetic tech. And, and everything that we think about is how do you design products and technology and use them in a way that the best people, the best human behaviors get replicated by technology. And we'll try to, we'll try to give you some, some examples of that. But it's a bit of a paradigm shift and we're really excited about the, the implications of thinking about every human behavior and how technology can be built to replicate and, and enable, enable that. So uh, let me try to make this a little more concrete with a few with a few examples. Uh, and again, most of these are outside of the world of education. So right now, most people think of video as great storytelling, right? It's a great tool to tell stories. We see it as the conversation starter. Like in this particular example that Mickey's gonna talk about, she's gonna be talking about students thanking donors, but then the corollary should be that should start a conversation. What do you care about? What are you passionate about, et cetera? If you think about training, over time, imagine it being non-linear, so that the training basically is, you're learning something in education, and then there's a pause where you basically say, I get it, I don't get it, et cetera. So reimagine video as a, as a conversation starter as opposed, to, as opposed to just telling a story. So it's not about just telling our story better, it's telling the right story at the right time to the right person. Uh, this is a CEO of a 22,000 person uh, organization, professional services organization. 
And we're all familiar with the concept of management by walking around, right? Undercover boss, et cetera. But what if we could uh, enable management by digitally walking around? When you have 22,000 employees across a whole geographic spectrum, how, how can you use technology to say, how's it going with our work and our culture? And do it in a pulse fashion, et cetera. And this particular leader has a passion for who's doing a great job of mentoring our people. So if you know, the existing paradigm is every leadership meeting saying we've got to do a better job mentoring our people. The new paradigm is why don't we listen to our people, hear who's doing a great job, and celebrate that, and kind of lead from the carrot approach as opposed to the stick approach. And it's basically enabled by the ability to listen at scale quickly. Uh, this is for a Fortune 25 financial services company that basically said, we want to understand how our clients in Shanghai, London, Sydney, and New York think about our products and our programs and understand the nuances. Now, one of the great things is everybody's phone is set to a language. So we know whether your phone is set to simplified Chinese or Portuguese, et cetera, et cetera. So you can very easily serve up the right listening experience by geography. And then on the back end, it's very easy to reassemble and compare by control groups. So as you think about distributed learning over time and you think about the ability to penetrate new markets, the ability to listen is going to be critical to your ability to provide the right product at the right time to the, to the right people. Uh, this is a professional sports league that basically, after every game, the coaches get a text that basically said, how do the officials do? It's a 30-second process, right? We actually put the pictures of the officials up there. It would only work in the context of a text. Think about getting the coaches in a professional sports league to answer an email, et cetera, et cetera. The idea for education is after every board meeting, after every advisory committee, some of your key volunteers, why aren't you sending a little something that says, how did you feel about the meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the solution we're trying to get at here is how do you, how do you reach really busy people um, and make it, make it easy? And we, and we get a response rate of close to 100%. Um, but it's only because it's a 30-second process. Uh, and, it's, and it's easy, and it's, in the, it's, it's received in the channel that they would like it. Uh, just a couple more uh, examples, and I'm going to kind of move to the results. So this is a consumer products company with 3.5 million, uh, a sales force of 3.5 million people. Like many of you, you spend a, an awful lot on technology. How would you know if it's working, right? So they wanted to know in 30 seconds, how much time is this new rollout saving you? This is an app. And get us the product roadmap. And we've gotten half of the people who've downloaded the app to respond. But it's because it's such a short, simple process. So one of our passions is for listening to move out of this squishy kind of cultural and move into the income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, et cetera, and solve real world problems like what should our capital, what should our capital spending plan be? And if you provide a feedback loop in every, in every process and make it crazy easy to do in the moment, technology can provide all kinds of, uh, all kinds of benefits. Um, lastly, for those of you who might be San Antonio Spurs fans, they basically looked and said, you know what, all of our fans have our app, so, and we make a significant uh, investment in that. Why don't we add a little employee feedback loop to this as well? Right? So think about the existing platforms you have and how you can basically leverage them in, in multiple ways. But fundamentally, we're providing a diagnostic, an ability to basically listen, to go from a broadcast culture to listen, uh, to broadcast listen personalize. And that's, that's really the promise of technology is, again, how do you replicate the best of human behavior uh, using technology? Uh, now, the second great part of human behavior is not only listening, but how would they know they were heard? Right? So one of the things we're doing with Notre Dame is building the ability to reply at scale. So if somebody tells you, you know, if a group of people, if 7,000 people say, I like this, how do you start serving them up with the right information? How do you attach, you know, how do you attach a video that says, like you, I'm struggling this, with this issue from a career standpoint, and basically provide the, the, you know, the right group uh, that, that ability to close the loop? So, and Mickey will share this. It's been kind of amazing how blown away people are when an organization like Notre Dame actually closes the loop, right? As opposed to it just going into this, into this, dark, into this dark hole. And our belief is that we can do a number of things to basically provide the ability to reply at scale, which will be very, very useful. I would argue there have been a lot of discussions over the last um, 
over this conference about distributed learning. And I would make the argument that you can't do distributed learning if you can't do distributed listening, that those two things need to, need to, 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 to work in concert. So those are some examples. Hopefully that makes it, makes it a little more tangible. So the impact of listening. Listening basically is designed to answer four questions. Not only what was good or not good, but what's important, how people are feeling, and then also who's doing a good job and why. So think about the value in your organization if you can answer those, those four questions. And I can tell you the crowd will answer those four questions if you ask them in a way that's easy for them to do. The third point, how people are feeling, I would make the argument that like United Airlines or perhaps SeaWorld, what they missed was, they had all kinds of people mapping the customer journey. I would argue what they missed was how were people feeling, right? And so as organizations, if you can figure out how people are feeling, that's a very different change for, for, for people to feel like, wow, Notre Dame gets me is, is sort of the objective of, of listening. Uh, this gets a little bit detailed, but I, one of the questions we, we get frequently is, is a reference point. How do I think about listening versus survey, for example? And I would say they're, they appear to be pretty similar, but they're actually very different. So in survey, basically the prompts drive the user. In listening, the user is driving the prompts. So if you think about it, in survey, the organization has said, here's what we think is important and we'd like you to fill in the, the answers to those questions so that we can aggregate the data and look at it, et cetera. In listening, the posture's a little more humble of what should we know? Take 30 seconds to tell us what's on your mind, et cetera, and depending on what you answer at the first prompt, then it drives, well, why, et cetera. That ends up being a much shorter process, but importantly, it also tells you what matters and doesn't matter when you let the user drive the prompt. So just to, just to give you one example, Outside of education, we have a Fortune 500 client. They have 3.3 million emojis that somebody could have selected about their business. You know, I like this factor, I like that factor, I don't like that. In reality, they've gotten 821,000 times that somebody said an attribute of their business was good, 39,000 times somebody said it was not so good, and two and a half million times it didn't matter. And I promise you, everybody in the room is spending a ton of money on things that don't matter. So the crowd will not only tell you the absence of feedback plays a critical role, and listening tells you what's important, which also by definition gives you the complement, which is what's not important. And when you understand that, you can basically make a number of, of, uh, of key trade-offs. I'm gonna spend a second on this slide. What we have found, and we, we started doing this in 2012, is initially, as the feedback came in, we were really excited about the response rates. The response rates, when you make it really easy, were, were exponentially higher, but the data was coming back too positive, right? We kept on looking at, we did a project with NBC and the, the, the veterans, uh, listening to veterans in San Diego, and that came out, you know, asking them about the VA and their wait times, 50-50. So far from being this group of negative complainers, actually most of your customers have something positive to say. Most of your donors have something positive to say. So the way this graph works is on the, on the, on the uh, y-axis are the barriers to feedback, and on the, the, the x-axis is the volume you get. And what we have found is less is more. So the more you lower the barrier to feedback, make a shorter process, et cetera, the volumes go up exponentially. The second thing that happens is they start to skew much more positively. So there's all these people who have something positive to say, they're just not gonna spend a ton of time and effort to tell you about it. But think about as a, as a manager, the, the paradigm difference when four out of five comments you're dealing with are positive. Think about what you can do for, with, your, with your team and your staff, et cetera. You, take, you, you fix the 20% that needs to be fixed, you don't suppress that, but basically you can, you can couch that negative with four positive comments. And so as a leader, uh, Peter Drucker talked about building on your islands of strength. As a leader, you start to, to, to operate from a different paradigm, a more positive paradigm. And it all it emanates from the fact that you get a data set that is closer to reality. So, so you no longer have sort of the loud source drowning out the crowd source or the city council meeting effect, meaning you had the people who actually travel to the city council meeting are not usually representative of actually the, the crowd. And so it's a very different data set that enables a very different management paradigm. Also, when you know, when, when you know what's good and not so good, and you know whether it matters or not, it becomes very easy to diagnose your business. So there's four quadrants. It's a strength, meaning 
the good emojis are pressed a lot and frequently. It's an issue that you need to fix, high frequency, skewing negative, or it doesn't matter. So you immediately get a clarity on your value proposition, what the issues are you need to fix. So in effect, the crowd does a lot of the work for you, but it all, it all starts from a paradigm of tell us what's important. And when you ask that question, the data actually ends up being a very different data set. This is my favorite, the favorite part of what we do. So I mentioned to you that typically four out of five comments are positive. In many industries, half of the comments are about an employee. So what it is that donors, consumers, others want to tell you about is your great people. So think about the potential for this. So this is an actual person. Uh, we've uh, hidden her name, disguised her name, but has 182 pieces of feedback. Think about, we, can, we, we built sort of the templates to put in the comments to say, here's what you do well, et cetera. So first of all, think about the potential to encourage your people with authentic testimonials from customers, colleagues, et cetera and to start to use that in training, diagnostics, et cetera. The other thing is think about the opportunity as a manager. Part of what we all do as managers is try to put our people in the positions that will basically fulfill their potential. Imagine when you have 182 data points about what Sarah T does well. Imagine the ability to try to get to, uh, to unleash the human talent associated with that. And again, it all starts from getting a massive quantity of, of feedback which skews positively and is about your people. So our passion, one of our greatest passions is to encourage millions of frontline workers. And that's what we see. Uh, just one anecdote, we have data on 5,000 restaurants. And if, if somebody says that there's good service, but they, pr but they put in the name of a person, Mickey. So we have a little field, is there somebody you want to recognize? The net promoter score or the positivity goes up 57%. So think about the potential, you know, from a donor standpoint, people to give to people not institutions. So if that personal connection, I think, is something that is basically totally underappreciated, and if technology can actually ironically play a key role in facilitating that personal connection, that's an example of kind of empathetic thinking. Um, to take it one step further, the Nashville Predators basically, they want to get traffic to their app. They want to get feedback. They also ask people to nominate the employee of the game. So they have this feel-good event, and they actually have a sponsor. So they actually make money off of feedback. And we find a lot of you will have the ability to have convening power, which will allow you to actually turn uh, listening into a, into a profit center. Um, let, me, let me wrap up. The biggest point that I want to make is a bit of a, of a cultural shift. So if I could encourage one thing, it would be for leaders to move from this notion of a broadcast culture to a listening culture. So what does that look like? You start to move from focusing on products and programs to outcomes. Uh, you go from telling the right story to going from telling our story better to telling the right story at the right time to the right person. In other words, you broadcast, listen, personalize. Thinking about technology as a way to scale empathy as opposed to simply drive, drive distribution or lower cost. Uh, understanding how the customer is feeling, not just the customer journey. And then lastly, and this is probably the scariest piece, and, and Mickey will talk about it. I know in my own case, I talk more when I'm insecure, and I listen more when I'm confident. So confident organizations over time will start to be less scripted and more organic, more letting the crowd take the organization where it, where it wants to go. And listening is the key enabler uh, of that. Another passion of, uh, of mine as a, as a reforming capitalist is tying all of this to ROI. Um, again, we don't want this whole discipline to be viewed as something kind of a nice to do. So here's two, two examples from the private sector of companies that do it very well. So the top one is actually, you probably know it better as Zara. They're a fast, they're, they're a retailer who basically incorporates feedback, a feedback loop into everything they do. They've outperformed their, their peers of last decade by 400%, and that's $75 billion of market cap. And their distinguishing capability is the ability to listen at scale quickly. Similarly, First Republic Bank is now, I think, a $25 billion company. They've, over the last seven years, have outperformed their, their competition by over twofold, and all they do is obsess with customer outcomes. And as a result of that, two-thirds of their growth has come from existing customers, and two-thirds of their referrals 
have come from existing customers. So think about the change in your cost structure when your existing customers are doing the work for you. It's a very different business model and paradigm. Um, so I'm gonna now turn it over to, to Mickey, who's amazing, but a big part of what we do is think about listening is not ubiquitous. We basically say, how do we have a listening strategy for the benefactors, for the recognition society members, for the long tail, and then also the people who are friends of the university that we'd like to become donors of the university. So it's not monolithic, but it's very much a customized strategy. All right, thank you, Rob. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mickey Kidder, as Rob said. I have the great privilege of serving as the Associate Vice President and Executive Director of Development at the University of Notre Dame. And we, I wanna uh, speak with you today really about two components. Both components were uh, referenced in the title of this session in both talent management and philanthropy. Um, I'll focus primarily on philanthropy, but I, I wanted to lead with that because I really want to emphasize to you that a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, you might say, well, the University of Notre Dame, it's at a different, you know, your scale might be different or your day-to-day -day, uh, work may be different than your respective organization. And I would challenge you on that because in my world, the two most important constituents based on the role that I have been asked to play within the university context are the benefactors I work with and the wonderful team whom I get the opportunity to work with every day. And I would argue that, or bet, that those of you sitting in this room would have the same uh, priorities. The individuals or the constituents which you have been asked to engage with to further your mission are in all likelihood uh, concentrated on those who are going to help your organization move that mission forward both externally as well as most importantly internally. So I'll give you examples today that focus on the benefactor world, but know that this can be applicable to your internal context. It can be applicable to any audience in which is most important to you to further that mission. So as we think about the University of Notre Dame, um, I really do feel that the partnership and the friendship that I've struck with Rob, I think that this is going to be transformational for the university's trajectory over time. And that is true because at the heart of what we do, at the heart of furthering this mission to educate the leaders of tomorrow to go out and really truly be a force for good and change this world for the better, uh, the most important part of what we do is we get to work with these students, we get to work with alumni, we get to work with parents, we get to work with fans of our athletic programs, fans of the Catholic Church, right? Those people who believe in the true goodness in this world and that in its entirety creates a family. What families do is they know one another. They, get, they know the passions of each individual. They listen to one another. They have conversations. We have always been able to do that on the top of our giving pyramid. So for those of you who work in philanthropic endeavors for your respective organization, in all likelihood, 90% of your philanthropy is coming from one or 2% of your donors. That's wonderful, that's absolutely how it is in our organization of the $500 million we're bringing in on an annual basis, 90% of that comes from a couple hundred donors a year. But that doesn't mean that the remaining 115,000 people who are making up that small percentage of our total philanthropy, that doesn't mean they're not important. They are extremely important. I haven't been able in the past though to talk with them, truly have a conversation in a really compelling way that is meaningful to them that illustrates to them that I know what their passions are, that I know that for whatever reason they love Notre Dame, some of them are gonna love it for the totality, right? They maybe went to school there, maybe they also had a child who went there, they're Catholic, they love sports. That's a small percentage of our population. Some people went there for a graduate program. It doesn't make any sense for me to send them materials asking them to become more involved with the mission of Notre Dame solely focused on the residential experience at the university. That makes no sense in the world. But that's pretty much what I've been doing for a long time now. What this allows is for me to send that graduate school uh, alum information about the graduate school. Or more in particular, information maybe about their specific discipline for their graduate degree. So I'm gonna give you an example, but know that in theory, the whole point here is that we're actually now treating these family members like family. We know who they are. We're having a conversation with them about what's most important to them. And we're listening. Uh, so let me give you an example. At the beginning of this, um, the, the, the real selling point to the audience, to whatever constituent you are trying to engage, is that it is so unbelievably easy to them. And instead of us bombarding them with constant information that we're asking them to consume, we're actually saying, hey, take a break from that. Tell us what you think. Tell us what's most important to you. 
And by the way, it takes less than 60 seconds for you to do that. So in less than 60 seconds, they can give us information that is unbelievably powerful. So this is an example of one particular exercise that we did. On the left-hand side of the screen here, you will see the message that we sent out. And basically what we said to them was, you are important to us, we'd like to learn more about you, and we'd like for you to give us some constructive feedback on how the university is doing in whatever context of your relationship that matters most to you. These are some components of the particular questions that we ask them. And we were very deliberate in what we asked them because what's really important at Notre Dame, as I said, that core mission of really being the premier Catholic university of our time and educating these le leaders of tomorrow, we have a core set of core values. And so many of those are reflected in the questions that we ask them. We ask what makes the university good from your perspective. It was very telling what they cl clicked on. As Rob said earlier, it was very telling on what they didn't click on. So that told me a wealth of information about them. What do you want to hear about? How do you want us to communicate with you? Do you actually feel compelled to donate to Notre Dame? How are we doing in that sense with regard to your philanthropic relationship? In less than 60 seconds, um, we had almost 16,000 people respond to us. The really revealing point of this is that the large majority of those people were not benefactors to Notre Dame in this particular fiscal year. That long tail that Rob talked about, at the top end on that y-axis, those are the people where we've got really intimate, deep, personal relationships. Those really weren't the people I was targeting with this exercise. I know them. I know what makes them tick. They're heavily invested in the university. What this allowed us was that long tail. The people who aren't really giving back to Notre Dame, they actually said yes. They accepted the invitation to respond to this question uh, or this particular invitation, and they told us a wealth of information about them. So almost 16,000 people responded. The vast majority of them actually said, you guys are doing a great job, which is really helpful to us, but they still weren't converting, right? They still weren't accepting that invitation to become more deeply involved in Notre Dame. And here's what I realized. They actually told us who was important to them within the Notre Dame context. Of the almost 9,000 people, you'll see a slide later on, uh, but in the event that we don't have time to spend a lot of time on it, I'll tell you, almost a quarter of them spoke about one particular person, Father Ted Hesburgh, a very iconic leader of Notre Dame. That speaks volumes to me about what I actually know, what makes them tick. Why do they love Notre Dame so much? Why did they respond that we're great or good? Now I know who, who has been instrumental in their life in really forming that deep relationship. And almost 10,000 specific interests were identified. You can see that, um, well, I'll get to this in a moment, but of those 10,000 specific interests, now I know exactly what to communicate with them about. One of the really important parts of this, though, as Rob said earlier, is closing the loop. So we went through a lot of those 16,000 responses, and we said, OK, what were the segments of these? Who said, yep, you guys are doing great, and I really feel compelled to donate? Who said, no, you're not doing well at all, and here's why? What we did then was we went back to them, and we said, thank you for giving us your feedback. We understand that maybe you have some concerns. Let's talk further about that completely blew them away, shocked them, right? You can see some examples of this. Um, some people said, boy, you're good. Now I'll actually have to donate to you because they probably never expected to hear from us ever, ever again. The point of this actually was not necessarily to convert them to a $25 donor. The point of this was to say to them, you really are important to us. And regardless of where you are on that spectrum of philanthropic investment, volunteerism, coming back to campus and celebrating with our students, you're a really important member of this family, and we want you to continue to be a, a member of this family. So it was a very authentic, genuine exercise to say to them, tell us what is important to you because we want to continue the conversation. Yes, admittedly, right, down the road, do I hope that they convert to a benefactor? Absolutely, because that's the role that I've been asked to play within the context of our mission. But most importantly, every single member who is uh, connected with this university is important, and we want them to know that, and we want to further that relationship with them. So I have mentioned this earlier, to, to ex expand on that, really at the heart of it, it is that we're treating family like family now. And so at, I would encourage you as you think through maybe your specific constituents or your audiences that you're focused on, are you creating a robust dialogue or are you simply uh, bombarding them with information about your respective organization? That would be kind of what we have been doing, right? We're broadcasting information to them, but we don't know anything about how they're consuming it. We don't know if it's appropriate, if it's applicable, if it's actually striking a passion with them. And now we do. 
So this is also similar to what Rob spoke about in terms of this broadcast the information out, really effectively listen, and then personalize that communication back to them. What it started doing for us is creating a true conversation. So as I said earlier, um, people who might have an interest in undergraduate programs and we were sending them information on Catholic mission, not hitting the mark, right? But people who now responded to this, um, this exercise and this conversation, now we can personalize that information to them. This is an example of one way in which we were to do so. So we had a lot of members of the Notre Dame family say to us, we really care about students. We really care about helping students come to Notre Dame for this experience and this education, and we care about financial aid within that context. So we created a video. These were all uh, first-generation students who were on significant financial aid, and they told their stories. It was simple as that. It brought a really human element to the stories and brought campus to life for these individuals. We sent this video out to those individuals who told us that. We asked them for more feedback after they watched this, this video. And the content of which they told us is instrumental in now the next conversation with them. So they were able to respond, what did you like about this video? Did you like that it brought the students to, to you? Did, you? did the topic resonate with you? Um, what do you want to hear about as we move forward? So we broadcast out initially, we listened to them, we personalized the context again, and now we're listening again and we'll personalize even further. So this, this idea of this conversation is ultimately what we're driving to. Um, I wanted to, to mention, in addition to the individuals and the topics, so we got information like, I'm interested in academics, or I'm interested in athletics, or I'm interested in Catholic mission. In addition to that, as I said, we got information on the people who have been instrumental in forming their relationship with the university. But we also heard from them specific words that really resonate with them. How to message to them is also a really important learning lesson from this, from this dialogue we're creating. So now let's take that individual who maybe they are an alum, they went to school, we know that the undergraduate experience is really robust and meaningful for them. We know that Father Ted Hesburgh was instrumental in their life, truly changing their life. Now they told us how, why. So they told us that the character that Father Ted brought, the character development, we learned that leadership is really important to them. Now I can construct an actual message that is meaningful, of high impact, and in all likelihood will prompt them to continue that conversation with us. And hopefully down the road, deepen their relationship in more meaningful ways through volunteerism, through getting them back to campus for reunion, things such as this. So how the conversation is constructed is also so incredibly important. As you guys know, if you're trying to communicate on scale to hundreds of thousands of people, every single word has to matter. And now I have feedback from these important constituents telling me exactly what they want that language to be, exactly what words are meaningful and of high impact to them. Here's an example. Uh, Rob spoke about this from an employee standpoint, but I'll give you an example within the philanthropic framework how this power of recognition of individuals is so important. So a significant number of people wrote back to us and said, Mike Bray is really important. Uh, Mike Bray being the uh, coach of our men's basketball team. So now I have this great matrix that I'm able to, to create of I know exactly who uh, said to us, yes, athletics is the driving factor for my relationship. I have now even another subset of people who said, and by the way, Mike Bray has been instrumental in my life. I've been able to share with Mike the impact that he has made on those individuals' lives and share with him the feedback that these important members of the Notre Dame family said about him and how they described him. So they described him as competitive, which we would hope he is, but they also described him as classy. Like they like the way he's coaching and leading these incredible student athletes on our campus. So I shared that information with him and then I shared it with the, with the people and told them that I shared that with Mike and what his response was. Blew them away, right? They never in a million years would have thought that that loop would have happened, especially at what is perceived to be a large organization, right? That that, that matters, what they said. And not only does it matter to us, it matters to Mike. So we created that loop and that conversation. A byproduct of it, though, which is extremely important to me, is now I have a short prospect list for really important funding priorities for the basketball program. We're creating a conversation, and we've invited a small group of individuals to become closer to that program. And that's important to them and will be fruitful for the university in the long run. So the power of recognition and the power of people in creating that dialogue 
it is uh, tenfold in terms of, of its impact, both to the institution as well as to these people. Rob mentioned this earlier, but I wanted to just give you um, and make it more tangible how exactly you can understand what themes you may need to touch on. For us, as an example, off the charts, people told us that being alum, an alum or being a parent was really important to them. You can see that in the strengths category. People said that athletics was really important in terms of their relationship. What they told us we weren't doing so great on, though, was maybe messaging the academic and the research, right? Or as you can see of a concern, diversity in the local community. Um, Notre Dame, admittedly, is a pretty homogenous environment. Um, we absolutely have as a priority for us internally on campus diversity and inclusion. Are we talking about that enough? Right? Are we talking about that and the importance and the priority of that if we know about it on campus and if Father John has made that a critical priority for the employees on campus, how are we engaging in dialogue with our alumni, parents, and friends so that they know that's a priority? How are we inviting them in so that they can maybe help us along that endeavor? They validated that in their response to us. It is a concern of the broader Notre Dame family with regard to diversity in local community. This has opened up huge doors for us, multiple doors. Now I can go to them, the people who specifically said this to me, and say, I understand that's a concern. We share that as a priority to broaden the diversity and inclusion on Notre Dame's campus. Help us along this journey. And, and that alone, that invitation alone, has, has broke down any barriers. You know, it, it, is, it has completely debunked their theory that Notre Dame is off in the middle of nowhere, literally, in the United States. Um, and that we're kind of in this little bubble and that we don't want to further in, in our advancement on this. Now they're helping us. Now they're helping us along that journey. So knowing who to speak with, what to speak with them about, and how to invite them in to help on these really important endeavors has completely changed the, the dynamics of those relationships with our broader alumni, parents, and friends. Um, I want to get to, to this one, which is very important. It has some very important people on this slide, right, Rob? Um, but uh, what this has also illustrated to us is what cohorts of individuals are really important to focus on. So in, I'm, I'm kind of this like uh, blue sky, always wearing a yellow hat person in that I want every member of this Notre Dame family to know that they're important. And I really genuinely mean that. They have some connection with this place and we have played a part in their life it's important that they know that we're here with them in the long haul. The reality is, I'm not going to be able to convince some people, right, over, this, over the context of this. Um, there are just some people who are really disgruntled and will remain disgruntled. That's fine. What this has really revealed to me is some cohorts of people are off the charts happy. And am I maximizing that relationship with those individuals in order to maximize their relationship with Notre Dame and ultimately invite them to further the mission? Parents is a perfect example. The parents, if you go back to some of these slides, they could not be more excited. Um, look where that proud alum or parent is, right? The parents were just screaming to us, we've entrusted our children to you. We love what their comprehensive experience is on your campus. We know you're giving them a great education, but it's also the intangibles around that. We couldn't be happier. Am I messaging to those parents enough and maximizing that opportunity enough in the context of what they've told us they're interested in. It's been a big uh, realization for us through this exercise. So not only has it again shown us what do they want to hear about, but it's really highlighted to me the most important constituents that I need to invest in now. Because think about that, parents, after those four years, I may not have the chance to reignite that relationship. So this has been a, a really big learning opportunity for us. What I wanted to end on um, is, is also another really byproduct of this, um, which is in, in higher education in particular, but I would argue in most educational environments, it can be pretty siloed, right? And so you have um, the College of Business sending out something, you have alumni relations sending out something, you have an, a center or institute on campus sending out something. Very rarely can a university come together and say, how are we effectively communicating to our constituents? And this has been incredibly powerful to remind me that even though it may be difficult to tear down these silos, and even though it may be very difficult to get a university of all these different units working together, it's incredibly important if we are going to maximize the opportunity with our constituents. Yes, through philanthropy, but I would argue through volunteer leadership as well. 
I had a particular individual respond and say, I got seven emails from you guys before noon today. To me, that was devastating, right? And so I tried to say to him, oh, that, that can't be. Well, it was in fact true, and he sent them all to me, all seven of them, and they came from alumni clubs, they came from development, they came from central communications. That should not be, right? What this is allowing us, this conversation that we're creating with our constituents, is the opportunity to go to different partners across campus and say, listen, not only do we know what's important to these people, but let's form together to create a truly strategic communication strategy that at the end of the day can have a greater impact on the university as a whole. And, and I really think that we have the opportunity to do this. It will not be with the stick. Rob and I have talked about this a lot of times. It's definitely not going to be with the stick for me to say to the College of Business, you can't send that email. What's the carrot to the College of Business to convince them to work with us in partnership to most effectively communicate with our constituents? And we have a great opportunity to do that because now everyone is telling us exactly what they're happy about and what they're frustrated about. And they're frustrated with the barrage of communications we're sending them before noon on any given day. So the long-term vision for this, I've explained to you a couple of scenarios of the short-term impact where we have now been able to collect information, uh, go back to them, to these individuals with a more personalized message. The short-term impact has been incredible. The long-term strategy of this though is to, on a more regular basis, create this true listening culture. And so we are creating what we're calling the Notre Dame Listening Center, which will be a tool that we can use internally to very quickly, efficiently send out information, uh, personalize that engagement in a more robust manner than we ever have before. But it's also about closing that loop on scale. So where I've been able to communicate to 200 people in a particular case, yes, we heard you and we know that you like to learn about this. Now we can do it at scale to say to the, to the masses, here's what you've told us. Here's what you've told us is important. Here are the things we're working on. You told us that we weren't doing quite so well in those areas. Here's what we're actually doing to further that conversation. It's a little risky for an organization that's pretty risk averse to put ourselves out there and say, yes, we heard you. You're not pleased with diversity and inclusion. But if we're going to move the needle, if we're going to deepen these relationships, it's hands down the right thing to do. So we're creating a much more transparent, much more robust listening center where we can have that personalized engagement uh, in an individual way, but also broadcast to the broader Notre Dame family how we are pivoting and refining our efforts and our messages based on what they're telling us. To close out, um, I just wanted to end with um, a quote actually is from the founder and CEO of Peloton. Um, as an avid Peloton owner, I uh, just was so excited whenever I got this email from, from uh, John Foley. He was essentially saying, listen, the strength of our brand will not be with John Foley. Right. The strength of the Peloton brand is from those individual Peloton owners and cyclists out there who are broadcasting and celebrating the core mission of this great organization. I want to change the paradigm within the University of Notre Dame culture as well. The University of Notre Dame could be perceived as a very large organization that moves slowly, that is risk averse, and is very much based in tradition. That is true, and I feel strongly about some of these traditions and our core mission that we forever need to celebrate. But the reality is the world is changing. And the reality is we are sending thousands of alumni out across the broader globe. We want them to be advocates of this mission. We want them to be those who are forming, who are refining, who are celebrating the mission in a very organic way. So this listening culture that we're strengthening allows us to do that, allows us to empower Notre Dame alumni, parents, and friends truly around the globe to celebrate the Notre Dame mission in a manner that's important to them, that will allow them to be great advocates, and that will allow them to shape the, the future of the university in a pretty powerful way. So listening, personalizing that conversation, and empowering our alumni, parents, and friends will drive and further the university's mission, and I believe, ultimately, will help in inviting those alumni, parents, and friends um, in a way that can, can further their individual relationships and ultimately, um, personally, you know, hopefully drive philanthropy, um, but more importantly, at the heart of this, drive the relationships, drive the respect, and drive the strength of the broader family. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we do have a couple minutes for questions, if, you, if anyone has any. Uh, yes? Hi, Simran. Can you explain the mic to you? Yes. Oh, yes. Hi, Simran. 
Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first part, but the last part was amazing. <laughs> it was really good to hear. Um, I'm curious as to what are some of the ways that you're seeing those advocates, or have you been able to get to that point of seeing those alumni actually interacting or giving back in ways other than just um, other than the money that other than money? Yes. So one example of that very recently, of the 16,000 people who I indicated there had responded, 2,000 of them have actually converted to benefactors, uh, first-time donors ever. That's huge for us, right? In a world where, uh, if, if any of you are working in uh, higher education, you know undergraduate alumni participations are declining significantly. It's really hard to convert a donor, especially when they can give locally, right? They can see the local impact. So for 2,000 of the 16,000 to convert to benefactors alone is tremendous. In addition to that, we saw a very active dialogue of this group on something that we call Notre Dame Day was recently. Many organizations across you know, higher ed are having giving days. Many communities are having giving days. Those individuals who responded to us and then we closed the loop with them, their advocacy on our giving day was extraordinary. They were building their networks for whatever student group, whatever residence hall, whatever alumni club they felt most passionate or were most aligned with. They were now stepping up to be advocates, where in the past they would be naysayers or quiet at best, right? Now, because we've actually said to them, yes, you're important and your voice matters, they're starting to have a voice within their networks of influencers, and that is creating this ripple effect of benefit for Notre Dame. And how did you send out the initial communication to them? Was that one more email, maybe the eighth in that morning? Well, yes. No, I did. It was not on that same day. Um, so yes is the short answer to your question. That was an email. But it's something that we're debating pretty actively. Um, I'm not convinced that email is that right avenue. Um, social media is also an area that we are exploring in terms of sending that invitation out. Text messages, we just had this debate, is that the right medium? So initially it was email, but we are going a route where we're gonna explore a lot of the other uh, avenues. Yeah, and we have, a, we have a lot of CEOs who actually are thinking about launching a, the CEO is listening through a video. So instead of getting an email, the people can hear their heart, you know, their heart, why they're, why they're doing it. And to Mickey's point, we are also starting to launch an awful lot off of social media, yeah. in addition to email. That's where I think that listening center can be really powerful too because it, I don't want it to forever be push to them, right? In an ideal scenario, we're creating a true culture of conversation to where they know where to go. They know where to give their input. Um, I think if we can get to that point, that's really where we're going to change the game in this space. <laughs>